Now at 11, breaking news. The death toll rises at the scene of a Southern California cliff collapse. Three people now dead. The details just coming in to our newsroom. Plus. A new report finds officers are not reporting use of force incidents properly. We'll tell you what Oakland police plan to do about it. SFO makes an unprecedented move. The one plastic item it's banning from businesses. And are you ready for a warm up? The temperatures to watch this weekend across the Bay Area. Good evening. I'm Veronica Dela Cruz. Well, it is a scene that is becoming all too familiar crumbling California cliff sides. And tonight we've learned three people are now dead after a cliff collapsed onto beachgoers in Encinitas, north of San Diego. Reporter Jake Reiner with the late breaking details. According to the city of Encinitas, the death toll has risen to three Friday night. As the tide continues to rise, the search has been called off to search for any additional victims, although lifeguards believe no one else is down there. A popular surfing spot turned into a horrific scene at Grandview Surf Beach in Encinitas late Friday afternoon. From above, you could see beach chairs, towels, surfboards, and beach toys scattered on the sand. The result result of a violent bluff collapse. The slab of Torrey Sandstone Del Mar Formation, it's a sandstone type bluff, uh, is about 30 feet long and basically when it collapsed it stretched out about 25 feet from the cliff out towards the ocean. San Diego County authorities say one woman was killed instantly at the scene. Hours later, the city of Encinitas is reporting that two of the three people taken to the hospital also died. An additional person refused medical treatment at the scene. Marine safety captain Larry Giles says it's amazing anyone survived, given how heavy the bluff was. According to soil engineer, it's extremely heavy amount of weight, um, tens of thousands of pounds um, in some of these uh, five to ten foot sections. Lifeguards say bluff collapses happen naturally at a frequency of four to eight times a year along the eroding San Diego coastline. And while a soil engineer says none of the nearby homes were in any danger, there was a fear of a secondary collapse. To make sure no one was trapped underneath the rubble, rescuers searched into the night as long as the tide allowed them. The fire rescue crews from multiple agencies came in, uh, dog teams, and they basically welcomed that area. And from what they could see at this particular time, they can't uh, indicate anything underneath the debris. As a safety precaution, the city of Encinitas has closed a big portion of this beach. As for the victims, no information has been released about them yet. We do know that no children were injured. In Encinitas, I'm Jake Reiner, KPIX 5. And back here in the Bay Area, a similar incident killed a woman at Fort Funston in February. A huge section of coastal bluff collapsed as she and another woman were walking a dog. Crews worked tirelessly to dig out the victim, but were eventually forced to call off the search. All right, switching gears now this weekend. You want to get ready for some inland heat. KPX 5's Paul Deanna tracking those numbers for us, Paul. Well, Veronica, you are right. Temperatures are going to climb mainly inland. The low cloud cover and fog keeping things chilly near the water. But if you head east, you'll likely find some 90s coming up, especially tomorrow. Temperatures tonight, everybody in the 60s. San Francisco foggy, breezy, and 60. Concord, 69 degrees. What happens tomorrow? We have a ridge of high pressure getting a little bit closer. That means Concord will shoot 5 degrees above average. Normal is 88. You'll hit at 93. San Jose comfortably in the mid 80s, 84 for you. Oakland, beautiful day, 75. San Francisco, you're not warming up. You'll stay in the mid 60s, 67, my forecast for tomorrow. How long the warmer weather inland sticks around? Coming up in my full forecast in about 10 minutes. All right, Paul, sounds good. Thank you. Activists for police accountability are sounding an alarm over some new findings in Oakland. KPX 5's Kristen Ayers is at police headquarters with how the department plans to respond. Kristen? The audit found that Oakland police failed to report use of force on a number of occasions. But tonight, activists are taking a closer look at the numbers and say they're finding even more disturbing information. The audit from the Office of the Inspector General confirms what Oakland's independent monitor already suspected. Uses of force are not always being reported in accordance with department policy and procedures. According to an audit of 47 cases, officers failed to report that they had pointed a gun at or physically tackled a person on 17 different occasions. Oftentimes, the subjects were people of color. This audit specifically calls out the fact that 
when Oakland Police Department officers used force against African Americans, they didn't report it. Henry Gage of the Oakland Coalition for Police Accountability says another disturbing highlight of the report, a misuse of body cameras. In 18 different incidents, officers either turned their body cameras on late or turned them off too early. In a written response, Oakland Police Chief Ann Kirkpatrick said officers were undergoing additional training on use of force reports and body cameras, and the department is now exploring using technology that tracks when officers unholster their firearms. She took steps to remedy them. She took steps to ensure their officers were trained properly and to help resolve some of the ambiguity in these policies. But that's not enough. Some of the issues with respect to supervision and the body cam activation and deactivation those are more reflective of what seems to be a deep-seated problem within this department. On the plus side for OPD, the audit found no instances of officers using unreasonable force. Oakland's police commission now plans to take up a top-to-bottom update of its use of force policy. In Oakland, Kristen Ayers, KPIX 5. Now, critics say the audit also undercuts claims by Oakland police about a sharp decline in use of force incidents in recent years. All right, a standoff on the peninsula has entered its 12th hour. Earlier, Chopper 5 flew over Tennessee Lane in Palo Alto, where police have been negotiating with a domestic violence suspect barricaded inside a home. Officers believe he is armed, but alone. They plan to keep the scene secure throughout the night. In the North Bay, police are on the lookout for a man accused of sexually assaulting a 16-year-old girl along the Copeland Creek path in Roner Park. The victim says she was walking around 10 o'clock on Tuesday night when a man followed and then attacked her. The suspect is described as a Latino man in his 20s with a tattoo on his left hand. Some new details tonight in the Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting. The coroner now confirms the gunman killed himself as police closed in. 19-year-old Santino Ligon, suspected of killing three people and injuring more than a dozen others. Gilroy police did shoot Ligon, but he fired the fatal shot. Gilroy's chief says today's findings don't change much. I don't think that changes anything about the heroics of our officers and engaging him. I, it really doesn't change anything in my mind. As of now, the motive for the shooting is still unknown. In the meantime, a South Bay pizza restaurant holding a fundraiser for shooting survivors. Tony and Alba's Pizza in San Jose is changing the name of its a la Gilroy Pizza to Gilroy Strong. Throughout the month of August, all proceeds from sales of that menu item will go to a victim's relief fund. The restaurant is also welcoming extra donations. And some other fundraisers to tell you about this weekend. Tomorrow, the San Jose Earthquakes will hold a silent auction at Avaya Stadium. Items up for bid include team signed jerseys and 2020 season tickets. Then on Sunday, there is a five hour benefit concert at the Britannia Arms Pub in San Jose. Now for more information on how you can help the victims of the Gilroy shooting, head to our website at kpix.com. New tonight, we're monitoring a power outage at a Southern California airport. It's having a ripple effect here in the Bay Area. The outage is at John Wayne Airport in Orange County, and that has prompted the cancellation of five flights from San Jose International, four flights out of Oakland, and one out of SFO. The power is slowly coming back online at John Wayne, but it will remain closed until 7 o'clock tomorrow. San Francisco International Airport is making history. It's going to be the first major U.S. airport to ban the sale of plastic water bottles in an effort to protect the environment. KPEX 5's Marie Medina is at the International Terminal with when this water bottle ban is expected to take effect. Maria? SFO is no stranger to sustainability. It's installed solar panels and Xeriscape, but now the airport is taking it one step further. If you fly through SFO starting August 20th, you may want to bring your own reusable water bottle. That's because businesses will be banned from selling plastic water bottles. SFO is sending an SOS for the environment by creating a rule on H2O. I think it's a fantastic idea. Banning all sales of single-use plastic water bottles in restaurants, shops, cafes, and vending machines. Instead, water will be sold in recyclable aluminum, glass, or compostable bottles. We can't go on like this. We have to put a stop to all the plastic. 
The move is in line with the airport's effort to reduce landfill waste and energy use, and also in part with the 2014 ban of the sale of plastic water bottles on San Francisco city-owned property. I live in New Zealand, and we've just recently introduced a law to outlaw single-use plastic bags. And at first, we felt like, ah, oh, that's going to be way too hard, can't do it. But you know what? It's easy. So people get used to it. I mean, plastic obviously is not environmentally safe, but on the other hand, what are we going to do? Travelers can still bring their own plastic or reusable water bottles. On the other side of TSA, SFOs installed dozens of hydration stations that disperse water for free. I guess that's a sign of the times. No plastic bags, no plastic bottles. Some would say the sign of better times, as SFO does its part to help the environment. It's a simple thing to do to help the earth. Yeah, I absolutely support it. And according to the SF Chronicle, airport staffs told vendors to provide only compostable foodware, including containers and condiment packets. SFO's goal is to become the world's first zero waste airport by 2021. At SFO, Marie Medina, KPIX 5. Coming up, new information from Yosemite. Three hikers hurt, one of them killed. The area officials are warning people about. Plus, the Bay Area housing market is known for its exorbitant prices, but we'll show you one city where you can buy a home for less than a half million dollars. And a woman gets back at her neighbors in a big, bold way, her sweet revenge. Well, it's one of the few Bay Area cities where you can still buy a home for less than a half a million dollars. KPX 5's Betty Yu shows us the real estate in Vallejo. So we get a nice galley-style kitchen. With this three-bedroom, two-bath home that's just under 2,000 square feet on Valley Vista is on the market for $475,000. That's about $10,000 more than the median sales price in Vallejo, according to Coldwell Banker Solano Pacific Realtor Linda Darskavich. The bidding wars have pretty much gone away. Houses are staying on the market a little bit longer. Um, so it's great for buyers right now. You know, the interest rates are still very good. Darskavich says priced out of most Bay Area cities, her clients say the affordable prices are the main reason they're now looking in Vallejo. We're getting um, younger people starting families middle-aged, kind of getting ready to retire. Across the Bay Area, the real estate market has softened compared to this time last year. Coldwell Baker says homes in Vallejo are staying on the market for an average of 45 days right now. A year ago, it was 14 days. I paid in the low 200s um, and I got a, uh, a two bedroom condo uh, up in the Glen Cove area. Vallejo native Colton Souza just became a first time homeowner. He works as an HVAC technician and uses the ferry occasionally. Realtors say the terminal has become a big draw for those who work in San Francisco, which is about 30 miles away. Vallejo has had a reputation for crime, but residents say things have gotten better since the city filed for bankruptcy in 2008. I've definitely seen it improve. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's got its faults like any town does. Uh, some a little more than others, you know, when you say that you live in Vallejo, there's a bit of a stigma with that. I feel like it's improved a lot, especially with having, um, when they started filming 13 Reasons Why, I feel like downtown Vallejo was more known. And um, I think the shops are still here. In Vallejo, Betty Yu, KPIX 5. Well, Vallejo has California's eighth most favorable cost of living. Tonight, a man accused of spray painting racial slurs on three East Bay homes is under arrest, but not for a hate crime. The vandalism happened in Bay Point early Wednesday, including the spray painting and a rock thrown through a window. An African-American family lives in each house. Sheriff's deputies arrested 63-year-old Alvin Brown early today in Oakland. Investigators believe he painted the racial slurs to try and hide his true motive. Mr. Brown has a personal relationship with one of the victims of the vandalism. All evidence indicates this was not a hate crime, but rather an attempt by Mr. Brown to make the vandalisms appear to be racially motivated, and we are confident this is not the case. 
Sheriff's officials are still investigating the nature of that relationship. Neighbors cleaning up the graffiti still think it was a hate crime. I would think that, yeah, it would be a hate crime. You know, it could be a black person or a white person, whoever did it. But what you did, it was still hateful. It was bold enough to say that word and put that word on people's houses, then he should be able to take the weight of um, the repercussions. Brown is now in jail in Martinez. Detectives plan to present the case to the DA's office on Monday. In Napa County, two mountain lion sightings were reported within the last 18 hours. The felines were seen near Fagan Creek and the railroad tracks near the airport. Officials are advising residents to be careful in the Napa County Airport area. And new tonight, we are learning there have been three incidents, including a fatality this week at the base of the waterfalls in Yosemite Valley. A 21-year-old who slipped on wet rocks and fell at the base of Bridalville Falls has died. Officials there say another hiker also left the established trail and had to be rescued. A third hiker slipped off a boulder and fell at the base of Lower Yosemite Falls. At one point, they were trapped underwater between rocks. Bystanders jumped into action to help before rescuers actually arrived. Well, a Southern California homeowner says her bright paint job with huge emojis is a work of art. But reporter Christy Bajardo says that some neighbors see a darker motive. This house has neighbors. From the zippered mouth to the long eyelashes, they say this is emoji for revenge. I think that it's not even ambiguous, actually. The zip the lip is very clearly language. We all know what that means. Neighbors say the pink and the emojis went up after the owner, Catherine Kidd, was fined $4,000. Her neighbors, including one known for her eyelash extensions, had complained to the city that she was illegally running a short-term rental. Kid eye rolls that theory. It's a message to me to be positive and happy and love life. I have eyelash extensions. Um, the eyes are like a Mona Lisa eyes. They kind of follow you. It might not be an emoji, but a hashtag the neighbors argue hints at her true intentions. In a now edited post under hashtag emoji house, the artist wrote, are your neighbors constantly ratting you out? Have they cost you thousands in fines? I think it violates every sense of common decency and neighborly act. I thought it was a cheery thing. I thought it was something positive. Kid, though, calls it art and hearts the paint job that people are even walking backwards to photograph. And the tenant gives it a thumbs up, a smiley face. Oh, yeah, and this, too. I thought it was hysterical. Um, I didn't really know that any story behind it, but uh, I just knew it was easy for my friends to find my place. Okay, so I guess it's funny if you don't have to live around it or in it. <laughs> I guess uh, you could have a laugh. That was Christy Fajardo reporting, and before that new paint job, the house was actually a pale, sandy color. I, I don't know, Paul. What did you think of that? It's, no, you can't find that color in Restoration Hardware. That's uh, all uh, I know. <laughs> that bright pink. No, it's, it's a little bright. As, you, know, as, you know, as long as you're not living in that neighborhood, and as long as you don't live in that house, right. it's okay. Looks cute as you're it's... driving by, heading to your house very far <laughs> down that way. That's hard, true. Hard to miss, that's for sure. All right, it's August and we have a wide temperature spread. San Francisco, not your warmest month yet. Summer really hasn't begun. 68 is your average high for the month of August. Livermore, though, it's hot. The average high is 89 degrees. We'll beat that by a few degrees this weekend. San Jose 84, Santa Rosa 82. Lots of fog over San Francisco. All this talk of a warm up for the weekend. Close your ears, not for you. 60 degrees won't make 70 this weekend in San Francisco. Inland, you will. Concord 69, Santa Rosa 63. Overnight lows tonight in the upper 50s to around 60 degrees. Good sleeping weather tonight. Fremont Festival of the Arts this weekend. Tomorrow and Sunday, sunny and warm. Beautiful. 80 degrees with blue sky. Stern Grove Festival, one of our cooler choices, literally and figuratively speaking. Sunday afternoon in San Francisco, mixture of sun and clouds, 63 degrees. Microclimate forecast, Santa Clara. Sunny tomorrow, 84 degrees. First preseason game in Santa Clara for the 49ers next weekend. Won't be as warm, likely. Sunday, 82 degrees. Temperature is pretty close to seasonal averages. So we were chilly and breezy yesterday. We won't be this weekend inland. What changed? Ridge of high pressure, a little bit closer. Storm passing by to our north, moving away. Those two combining for less of an ocean influence, and that means temperatures will climb, but only away from the water. Look at all the clouds near the bay and at the coastline tomorrow morning, at the coast tomorrow afternoon as well. Everybody else basking in the sunshine with 
temperatures running a couple degrees above average. More morning clouds, more afternoon sunshine on Sunday. Next week, everybody cools down. That ridge is gone. Another storm moves in pretty close to us. We're not going to get rainfall, but we all will cool down next week with a stronger onshore flow. So if you like it warm, tomorrow will be the warmest day of the next week. Low 90s, Fairfield and Livermore, 90 in Santa Rosa, 84 San Jose, 75 in Oakland, 82 in Redwood City, 67 in San Francisco. Your extended forecast calling for a couple degrees cooler coming up on Sunday. As we head toward next week, we will cool down even more with temperatures in the 60s and we'll have highs only in the low 60s for the next seven days at the coast. Darren Peck with an update on your forecast tomorrow morning starting at 6 o'clock. Not hot like last weekend, but temperatures will climb uh, pretty comfortable outside both Saturday and Sunday. Good looking weekend forecast. Yeah. All right. Looking forward to that, yep. Paul. Thank you. New shocking video coming up. Literally shocking how one town is working to eradicate an invasive species. Also a programming note. If you missed your favorite CBS shows last Sunday due to some breaking news, we wanted to let you know you can now catch up on the latest episodes all online. CBS.com. All right, some pretty bizarre video out of Kentucky tonight. We should warn you, it is literally shocking. Wow, take a look at that. This is how fish and wildlife have been dealing with an explosion in the carp population. Officials use what they call electrofishing equipment to shock the fish just long enough to stun them. And then they scoop them up and then they count them, they test them, and then they safely, safely relocate them. That's a lot of carp. They're safe. They're safe. No, nothing That's to be worried all about. That matters. And they're being relocated. Mm. So Great. good news. Fantastic. Mm. <laughs> well, Fishing. coming up in sports, he has a cannon of an arm, but never got a second look from a major league team until now. And Mike Yastrzemski with a bomb out to right. But can he power the Giants to their first win in the month of August? We'll be right back of August is getting off to a rough start for the Giants. The orange and black are back to more of their early season form after a sizzling month of July. Manager Bruce Bochy treated to a farewell celebration in what is likely his final appearance in the Mile High City. We go to the fifth. Game tied at two. Mike Yastrzemski blasts this one to right. 472 feet. It's 4-2 to two Giants. But in the bottom of the sixth, Colorado answers. Ryan McMahon takes Sam Selman deep. That ties the game at four. And then in the seventh inning, Reyes Moranta. He comes in. He has trouble throwing strikes in this double. Scores Charlie Blackman and the Giants trail 5-4. to four. Top of the ninth with two on and it's Yastrzemski up to bat again. This time he grounds into a double play to end the game and San Francisco is back to 500 as they lose by a final of 5-4. to four. Well the A's have a rare Friday off but they were still able to be part of the most interesting story in baseball today. Two weeks ago, Nathan Patterson tried the speed pitch at the Colorado Rockies game and hit as high as 96 miles per hour. He did the same thing at a triple A game last year. Well, yesterday the A's signed a 23 year old to a minor league contract with Oakland's rookie league team in Arizona. Well, the Raiders will play their first preseason game a week from tomorrow against the Rams, but their biggest acquisition, four-time All-Pro wide receiver Antonio Brown, has not fully participated in practices due to an undisclosed injury. Coach John Gruden is hopeful Brown will soon be making his full camp debut. I think we're all disappointed. We, we uh, think he's disappointed. We like to, you know, get the party started. We like to get him out here. He's big part of this team but uh, in the time being we're going to continue to work hard and we've seen a development of some other receivers we're excited about. Blessing in disguise then I mean obviously you want Antonio out there but if he's not there then these other guys are getting quality. I'm not going to get into all that I I want the guy out here as soon as possible I'd like him to never leave and stay in the huddle every play. Well, he's definitely got the hot air balloon thing down, so there's that. <laughs> right? That's all that matters, no, but I mean, you know, it, he's a veteran enough guy where missing a couple preseason games is not going to hurt him. Mm -hmm. We'll just see when he's going to actually start practicing yep. with this team because he kind of needs to build up that chemistry with Carr. Yep. Yeah. And they need yeah. him. And they need him. Yes, they yeah. do. I can't <laughs> believe it's football season yeah. already. Crazy, right? Yeah, you ready? <laughs> we'll be right back. Well, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert is up next. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a terrific weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday.